Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Our presenter in this morning's session is Dr. Christopher Shetler from Central Washington University. Chris is a professor of English, and he has extensive experience in e-learning. Um, before I turn the mic over to Chris, I just wanted to really quickly mention a couple of things. The first thing is that you are all muted during the presentation, but we do have co both Q&A and chat enabled. So if you have any questions or comments at any point, please feel free to share. We have Velda Arno and Emily Householder from the board help monitor both areas. Um, the second thing is that we don't have closed captioning for our live events, but um, closed captioning will be added in post-production. Okay, Chris, I'm going to turn the mic over to you now. Okay, thank you, Weiwei, and thank you everyone for joining us here. I know that um, it's the beginning of the quarter for many people, or you're preparing for the quarter, and I appreciate you taking the time to uh, attend this webinar and uh, hear about my experiences with uh, online discussions and annotation tools. And I do hope to make this a, an interactive kind of presentation. So uh, do feel free to chat in, in the chat box and ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, and if you want to just to get started in the chat, just um, let us know where you're from, your, your institution. Um, just so we have a sense of uh, the people who are represented here. And uh, as we go along, I'll have some questions for you also, which you can respond to in the chat. And um, we'll be taking your questions and uh, saving them for the end primarily. So I'll definitely leave some time for you to, res for, to respond to your, your questions. Um, just a little bit more about myself. Um, as Weiwei said, I'm a professor of English. At Central Washington University, I teach American literature and multicultural literature, uh, particularly Latino Latin American studies and American Indian studies. Uh, I also served as faculty director and executive director of multimodal learning at our campus, which uh, oversees online learning, distance education, and use of edu educational technologies on campus. I've taught quite a few online and hybrid courses. Um, and done a lot of faculty development webinars and workshops as well. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, hearing from all of you uh, and I appreciate your, your participation. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen now. Get started with the, the presentation. Um, so yeah, this is really about two different tools that I've been using uh, for online student engagement. Discussion forums, which people are very familiar with, I'm, I'm sure, in the learning management systems, uh, but also online annotation tools uh, for annotating digital text and uh, social reading practices. And so I was interested in um, comparing these two types of tools and how they help with uh, online student engagement. Um, you see my information here and do feel free to um, contact me by email uh, after the presentation if you have any questions or follow-up that, that you'd like from me. So the first thing I thought would be good is to define student engagement. Um, so I, I took this definition from Claire Howell Major in uh, her work Teaching Online. Um, she says that student engagement is uh, student, students' willingness and desire to participate and be successful in a learning process that leads them to higher level thinking and long-term understanding. And really what I want to focus on in terms of this, um, there are a few different aspects of that engagement that uh, Major talks about, motivation, attention, involvement, and intellectual effort by students. Um, for this presentation and in terms of the tools that I've been using, uh, really I was looking primarily at how involved students are uh, and their intellectual effort in engaging with these digital texts. Um, so, looks like someone is raising their hands. I don't know, Weiwei, wait, if you can uh, address that or if we want to. Okay, um, 
I actually don't see anyone raising their hands yet. Okay. But we'll watch it for you. Great. Um, so I put this information in here just in terms of the challenge uh, that faculty face and students face in being engaged in online classes. Um, so the top information is from a survey by Titan Partners called Time for Class. And they ask about the instructional challenges that faculty seek to solve. And as you see, 50% of faculty said increasing student engagement in class was one of their top instructional challenges. And then the bottom information is from a student survey by Top Hat uh, that was called Adrift in a Pandemic, which was looking at how students uh, are engaging with their classes during remote learning, you know, during the spring uh, at the beginning of this pandemic. And 78% of students said that the online class experience or the remote learning experience that they were in, involved in was unengaging. So um, for both faculty and students, the, the aspect, the challenge of engagement is something that's top of mind for them. So I want to just start and ask, um, what kind of challenges have you faced getting students to engage in online classes? And you can respond in the chat uh, for this question. Um, and whether you're a faculty member or whether you're an instructional designer, maybe that have heard from faculty, uh, what are the kinds of challenges that you see in, in getting students to engage? And we'll just take a minute or so uh, to have some people respond. And I also want to just remind everyone really quickly that in, in the chat, in the tool field, I think by default it's going to all panelists. So if you click on the drop down menu, you will go to all panelists and attendees. So if this is something that you want to share with everybody, uh, make sure you switch the tool field setting. I was just looking to see if I can see the chat, if I need to stop sharing. Let's stop sharing for a second here just to... I can read chat. them to you if you'd like, Chris. Uh, I, can, I can look here. Students said they found forms busy work respond to other, other student classmates and then disengage, different time zones, schedules, radio silence from students, engaging on the surface level, not taking the time to fully participate. Yeah, definitely, these are, these are all challenges about how um, you kind of go beyond that surface level and dig in deeper to get students not only involved but involved kind of rigorously in their responses and in their engagement um, and how to motivate them to get them to engage in certain ways. So that's great. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing again here. Um, so then we think about what are the tools then? We have these challenges of student engagement. So uh, in terms of choosing tools that we can use for student engagement, um, Tamara uh, Girardi says in an essay in Applied Pedagogies that online faculty must carefully analyze, select, implement, and assess what tools best create an online community and engage students in the online environment. So when I was thinking about the tools that I wanted to use for engagement, uh, in particular, I was focused on student-to-student -student interaction and student-to-content interaction. Um, and the other would be 
instructor to student interaction. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of this session. But these were the main uh, aspects of engagement that I, I wanted to focus on. Uh, so now here's a question about what tools you use to engage students in online classes or uh, as faculty members or the kind of tools that you suggest to faculty. Uh, and I'm going to start a poll here. So um, I, I've given you a couple options, the discussion forums and annotation tools Turner. that um, that we're talking about here, but also collaborative documents uh, like Google Docs, um, shared Word documents, and peer review assignments uh, that, that engage students in reviewing each other's work. So just give you a minute here to respond to that. You can choose multiple options here as well. I am not seeing a poll. I wonder if it goes to panelists or just attendees. Um, Melda, I can see it. I think um, it's probably in a pop-up window somewhere. Okay, yeah. thanks. <laughs> okay, it looks like we have nine who have responded, 10. So I'm gonna close the poll so we can see the information. So nine out of 10 said they use discussion forums, which uh, yeah, is expected. They're very ubiquitous in terms of the learning management system. Only one has used annotation tools. So that should be interesting for those of you who haven't um, to hear a little bit about the annotation tool I use. Collaborative documents, 40%, four out of 10, and peer review assignments, five out of 10, great. Um, share those results with you so you can see those. So a little bit about my course. Um, it was an intro to literature course. It was a general education course. Uh, there was a maximum of 25 students. So it's um, small enough that it allows for uh, quite a bit of engagement uh, between the students. Um, I used an open education digital textbook from Lumen Learning from this, and because of that, because it was a digital textbook, it really allowed me to utilize the annotation tools uh, to provide students an opportunity for annotating and social reading with these digital texts. Um, I got an open education resource grant from our CWU library to develop this course uh, with open education resources, um, and they had received funds from Washington State for this grant. Uh, I also got an online course development gra grant from our multimodal learning group on campus um, to develop it, to teach it online. Uh, and as I said, I use Canvas for discussions and, and Cruzol for annotations, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, so I assume most of you in the Northwest are using Canvas and are familiar with Canvas discussions, which allow for threaded discussions, forums. Um, you can have audio and video. Uh, responses as well as text-based responses uh, and it's a pretty user-friendly um, interface for discussion and students are very familiar with it uh, since a lot of them also um, have been using Canvas you know uh, whether they're in community college or one of the four-year institutions. Um, so peruse all then for annotation as I said this was something that I just started using uh, in the spring and it allows you to upload digital text, uh, PDFs, Word documents, um, or actually to import textbooks uh, with publishers that they um, have uh, agreements with, partnerships with. Um, and students go in and they can highlight text and then they comment, make annotations on those highlighted texts. They can view each other's comments. Uh, they can respond in conversations. Um, they can take notes, they get notifications when someone responds to them directly or to one of their comments. Um, and there's some analytical tools within the 
uh, within the platform that also allows you, as I'll talk about, to dive a little bit deeper into how long students are reading, actively reading the text, um, how many comments they have, how many responses they have. Um, you can even upvote and, and like different comments as well. So there's an aspect of um, kind of social interaction through this reading process as well. Um, so in terms of the assignments then, uh, I had discussion assignments and I had annotation assignments. Uh, and I tried to make them as pretty similar in terms of what I'm asking for students in terms of their initial postings of 200 to 250 words. Uh, I asked them to use quotations and examples from the reading as evidence for their points and then compose at least two follow-up responses to other students' postings uh, and respond to any follow-up questions directed at them by the instructor or students. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how that helps facilitate interaction and engagement uh, and, and how that moves beyond the superficial kind of post to responses to really have a more engaging and active discussion. Um, I asked some survey questions of students just very informally um, because I wanted to get their feedback as well on their use of Perusall and Canvas. Um, so I asked them to compare the two in terms of facilitating interaction with other students, which is about that student to student interaction, uh, and then facilitating understanding of the reading assignment, which is about that student to content interaction. Uh, and then I also asked them to compare the two in terms of how easy it is to use the technology just to get a sense of um, their, their interaction yeah, with the technology and the usability. In terms of their responses to this survey, um, they preferred discussions for student to student interaction. They said it was very simple to post and respond. They could find all the threads on one page, even though you have to do maybe a bunch of scrolling to find them, they're all there contained on, on one page. They felt it was easier to navigate the threads and the students are listed by name. So if they're responding to a student, they can say, you know, hi, Emily, uh, I read your response, etc." cetera. And um, so part of that I think was that they were very familiar with discussions. Um, they knew how, how they worked and they found it very user-friendly, both I think in terms of uh, a desktop or a laptop, as well as on their phone, because we know that students are engaging with online classes and materials more and more on mobile devices. Um, so for that, it was very familiar to them. They liked it for the student-to-student -student interaction. In terms of their responses to annotations, uh, they said they did prefer it for student to content interaction, uh, as you might expect, because the text was right there in front of them. They could easily find a quote, copy and paste it into their comments. Um, they didn't have to move back and forth between two different screens or between you know, the text and the annotation tool. Uh, the text and comments were there side by side. It was easy to find the evidence from the text. Uh, some people felt that when uh, they were reading through a document and students had already highlighted it, uh, it was a little distracting for them to read uh, because they might get distracted by a comment or one or the highlighting um, disrupted their reading. But there is a uh, function or feature within Prusa where you can turn off all the, the highlights so you can read just a blank text and then turn back on the highlighting um, after you've read through it. Um, you can only do one highlight per annotation. And so some people, they wanted to be able to highlight more of the text and have one comment rather than multiple comments on, on different highlighted sections. Uh, one thing they didn't appreciate as much is that the threads or the conversations in Perusal are on separate pages. So it's not as easy or streamlined to find all the responses and, and respond to other students. You have to kind of click through each of the conversations to, to respond to 
um, multiple students. And the students, uh, they're listed just by their initials. Uh, and if you highlight it, uh, their initials, it will tell you their full name, but they felt like it was more difficult to identify the students that they wanted to respond to for replies. Um, and it's not directly threaded either. Um, you can't reply directly underneath a comment. Um, there, it's more separated as you can see here on the screenshot. And so if you're replying to a specific student, you have to use an at sign um, to, to show that you're responding directly to that student. Um, so both Canvas uh, or discussions and Prusol have analytics. Um, we also at CWU use a tool called Threads, uh, which is an LTI um, that you install within Canvas that gives you more detailed kind of analytics around online discussions. Uh, and there are a variety of different ways that you can visualize the data for discussions. Um, you can have a network line node graph like you see on the left here that has user hubs and spokes, which will show you like the larger the, um, the sphere here, the more, for example, words that have been posted or the more posts. Uh, and you can choose you know, how you want that data to be visualized. And you can also see how, how students are responding to each other. And maybe there's some outliers you know, where you have a very small circle that shows they haven't uh, posted much and they're only have been responded to by one other person. Uh, and that gives you a way of going back and checking in with students and saying, you know, like I see you didn't post it as much this week. Um, it was something going on or is there a way that we can get you engaged more in the discussion? Uh, there's also uh, what's called a chord graph, um, which you see on the right here, which shows both the number and directionality of replies. And so, um, when you see uh, larger amounts of color, that shows that they're um, engaged and responding, have, have more posts. Uh, and you can see by following the line who they are responding to um, and which way the response is going, whether it, if it's fatter on one side, they're responding to a person. If it's fatter on the other side, the person is responding to them. Uh, and so that gives you a way of seeing, again, like what's the level of engagement between students within a discussion? Um, not just that they've been doing, you know, their required postings, but that they're actually engaging with other students uh, in their comments and responses. Um, there's also data you can get um, with statistics about number of posts, total word count, average word count. So um, you can get some data that way to compare students on, on their levels of engagement. The analytics for uh, annotations in Perusal um, are a little bit different. Uh, there is some overlap, but um, they have a submission time heat map, which you see in this top bar. Uh, and that tells you when students are actively reading and submitting. Um, if you want to know about you know, the amount of time and the time specifically that students are engaged with reading uh, and whether they're commenting you know with each other uh, and and you can see that as we expect a lot of the um, activity going on with annotations is, is later in the evening um, with students especially in, in online courses um, you can get grade distribution information perusal will uh, do some machine grading uh, of comments and it actually goes through and looks at both the quantity and quality of the comments based on their algorithms. Um, you can see activity, um, as you see in the, the box to the left here, about how long they were viewing a text, their active reading time, the number of annotations that they've given. Uh, and active reading for perusal means whether they were moving their mouse over a digital text or whether they were pressing a key every approximately two minutes, 
that means that they are actively engaged in reading. So not just that they pulled up a text uh, and um, left it up there, you know, for an hour, but that they were actively engaged in moving through that text or commenting and annotating on that text. So comparing the analytics uh, for discussions and annotations, um, there was some interesting variation between them. Um, in discussions, students averaged around four posts. Um, and remember that I asked them to do one initial posting and two responses. Um, and so in the discussions, they actually went beyond the minimum uh, as, as average. You know, there were students who did quite a bit more than that six or seven posts and students who did less, but it averaged out to four. In annotations, um, it was normally three. They did the minimum. In terms of word count uh, in discussions, they posted over 500 words, um, which, as you'll remember, is, is double, really. The initial posting was supposed to be between 200 and 250 words. Um, so they're posting 500 plus words in discussions. Uh, and in annotations, they are doing a little bit more than the minimum, 360 plus words, but not as much as in discussions. So um, for, for various reasons, you know, whether it's um, because it's easier to find and respond in discussions, they're writing more. They're, they're producing more writing in discussions. Um, they receive the same number of plot replies on average too. Uh, but one interesting thing that I found is that in discussions, there were only a few students who didn't receive any replies to their, their initial postings. Um, whereas in annotations, it was more like seven to eight students who didn't receive any replies. Uh, and I think that may be because of what students said, it's harder to find this, the conversations and to respond to students directly within perusal, within the annotations. Um, and so some students get lost, their comments get lost a little bit. Uh, and students, other students aren't finding them to respond to them. So I thought that that was interesting. If you're trying to, you know, make sure that students get some kind of response in, in perusal and in annotations, um, there are there are more students who get a little bit lost in that and, and don't get a response. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about now the quality of student responses. And I just want to show you that I do use a rubric for both discussion and annotations. Uh, and they're very similar. I tried to make them almost um, the same with just of some variation in words. But two things that I want to highlight is that um, I do focus on the evidence that students are using for their points, um, using appropriate quotes and examples from the text, and I do grade them also on follow-up responses, um, so that to make sure that they are actually um, asking questions of each other, responding to each other's questions, and engaging more in an active discussion. Um, so when I look through the comment analysis uh, and did some um, kind of looking at how many quotes they used and whether they're asking questions of each other, um, I found that discussions and annotations were very similar. Um, so almost the same number of quotes from the text, um, even in annotations where the text was right there in front of them, they were um, quoting quite a bit. This is averaging out per assignment. Um, so, you know, in a class with 25 students or so, you know, they're using about two, two quotes um, per assignment from the text. And when they're asking questions of other students also, I found that um, both in discussions and annotations, there were similar number of questions that were posed by students to other students. Uh, and of course, so quoting from the text, that's about the student to content interaction and use of evidence to support their arguments. The questions show that they're engaged in student to student interaction uh, and they're building this shared knowledge together. 
Uh, and like I said, there wasn't really any significant difference between discussions and annot annotations in these areas, even though students, you know, had a preference of one or the other uh, for different types of interaction. They actually were engaged and using the tools in similar ways in terms of um, student to content interaction and student to student interaction. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can both create online engagement and facilitate online engagement in using these tools. And these are uh, just some best practices that I found that I use and that I found, you know, in the research and in the, the best practices of, of other instructor, instructors and um, instructional designers and developers. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about these things uh, and then um, also want to hear from you all about um, the best practices that you have and strategies and tips that you have for creating online engagement as well. Um, so in terms of creating online engagement, both in discussions, when you're creating prompts, when you're creating questions, um, thinking about having students respond to their muddiest moments, uh, things that they don't understand in a reading in a digital text, uh, and also the aha moments, those moments when they had some insight, you know, that they want to focus on. So using prompts like that where, you know, what, what don't you understand? What was new that, what was insightful that you found in this reading can be a good way to engage students. Um, other ways of engaging them through case studies, through controversies or debates. Um, these are ways that to engage students in a text that has multiple engagement points, really, you could say. Like in a debate, there's pros and cons and controversies. You know, there's more than one way to address it. Um, case studies ask them to engage in a real life kind of activity or experience uh, and figure out how they would approach it. And current events is something, you know, that is engaging to them in terms of um, something that's going on in the real world. And the more that they can connect content or concepts to their life, their school, their work, or things they see in the media, that's a way to get them involved and get them engaged because they see that um, connection to the real world, to what's going on around them. Um, another idea is to get students playing different roles, um, you know, whether it's in a case study where they can take on different positions um, or whether they can take on roles such as, you know, the questioner, the um, explainer, the, um, the textual editor, um, different roles that they can use to engage with these texts. Um, you can also think about having students do all class or small group kinds of discussions um, and annotations that sometimes it's good to have students in a large discussion. Sometimes it's good to break them up into smaller groups uh, and allow them to engage on a, a closer level with other students and then maybe come back and report to the, the class or the larger group about what they discovered in their small group discussions um, or engagement. I also like to have students moderate uh, discussions um, and annotation assignments. So, for example, in my class, I have students do research, do outside research about a topic, um, develop some presentation materials, whether it's PowerPoint or a handout, uh, and post that so that other students can see the work that they've done. Uh, and then the presenter will ask questions of other students related to their research or related to the text. And the presenter is then the moderator. They're responsible for facilitating that discussion um, or that uh, annotation assignment. And that way, they become the expert. They take ownership of the, um, their research and their engagement with the text. Uh, and other students can see that modeled uh, and you have that more peer-to-peer -peer sharing of information rather than the students looking directly to the faculty member always to lead the discussion or to post the questions. Um, 
also to have students self-reflect on their responses and their engagement um, during the maybe at the end of the quarter at the end of the term um, how have they grown in terms of their responses in terms of their writing in terms of their engagement with other students um, so that's a good way to have students reflect on how engaged they were in the class and what they learned and developed as a result of these uh, assignments, discussion and annotation assignments. In terms of facilitating online engagement, um, these are just some tips that I have for how you can make sure that you are incentivizing uh, and helping students recognize the value of engaging in these online types of assignments. So the first is really to make sure that you're giving appropriate points and weight uh, to these types of assignments to incentivize students to participate. That is, you know, we know that students often are very transactional in terms of their education and they will participate in assignments that have more weight in terms of their grading. Um, so if you do want students to be engaged and participate in these kinds of assignments, you need to give them the incentive through grades to actively participate. So in my classes, you know, participation in these types of discussions and online assignments can be 25% of their grade or more uh, and really, you know, because I'm a literature professor, the discussions are the, the main aspect of the course, but they know that this is um, important for their, their grades. You can post models of good and poor postings and follow-up replies so students can see what you're expecting in terms of their responses uh, and, you know, what you're looking for, what you value uh, in terms of their responses, not just a, a simply you know, this was good, I liked it, good response, but actually digging in more deeper to the text and to following up with uh, active responses to other students. And I always grade the follow-up replies. So part of their rubric, as you saw, is that um, I'm not just grading that they responded twice to other students, but I'm actually evaluating their replies. So did they quote from the other student? Did they ask a question? Did they engage with a specific idea of that other student? Um, did they bring in more evidence from the text? Uh, and these are all things that I will grade them on and I will give them feedback on and say, you know, for your responses to other students, you need to be doing more of this uh, in order to develop that online discussion and, and that interaction. I would strongly recommend that you have multiple and early deadlines. So if you have a weekly kind of schedule for students to respond in discussions or annotations, that there's multiple deadlines. So they have an, a deadline early in the week when they have to do their initial posting, and then maybe the next day or the day after they have to post their follow-up responses. And so students aren't waiting till the end of the week to for their initial posting, and then students don't have any time to read other students' responses postings and respond to them, um, giving them an early deadline and then a later deadline, make sure that the discussion is spread out over the week uh, and that people are engaging early and often and then responding. Also making sure that any kind of prompts that you use uh, have multiple answers or choices. You don't want a prompt that has one answer and everyone posts that same answer. Um, that's really an assignment. That's not a discussion. Um, so you want to give prompts either where there are multiple questions that students can respond to or that a question has multiple choices, multiple answers that students can choose that gives them an opportunity to take different perspectives on that prompt. Um, when you can focus responses, like if you can focus students in on a particular passage of a text or ask them to engage with a specific concept or a specific theory, that will help them rather than saying, you know, very open-endedly, you know, like, what was your response to this reading? Or, um, what did you find interesting? But more focused to get them to engage directly with the text. 
Um, and then it's also always good to have netiquette guidelines uh, which suggest your expectations uh, for this online discussion or engagement, um, how they should re be responding to each other, that they should be using each other's names in their responses, you know, that they shouldn't be flaming or using all caps, that um, they should be civil in their responses to each other, uh, especially around, you know, difficult topics. Um, and so just what, you, what your expectations are in terms of how they engage with each other in those online kinds of activities. Uh, and then I said that I would talk a little bit about instructor to student interaction. And this is really around the kind of feedback that you're giving to students, um, how you're engaging as the instructor in discussions and annotation assignments. Um, so it's very important to give timely and specific feedback to students. Uh, and I would suggest using a rubric uh, like you saw that I use um, that allows you to give very specific targeted kind of feedback to students around the criteria that are important to you um, that you value in these online interactions and discussions uh, and that you respond to them in a timely way so that they're getting feedback you know on a weekly basis so that they can improve their discussion responses um, i definitely see this uh, having a lot of impact on students where you know the first week they will be doing more of that kind of okay post once comment twice superficial but when i give them feedback about no that's not necessarily up to snuff in terms of what i'm looking for you need to be doing more of this and you need to be quoting more you need to be using examples you need to be responding to other students with questions with more uh, engagement in terms of their ideas then you see even the next week and subsequent weeks that the discussion, uh, the engagement will just start to take off. And, you know, where you'll go from three comments per student, you know, in the first week to five or six or seven uh, as the weeks go on. And that really gets a full dynamic kind of uh, engagement going. It is good to make sure that each student receives some kind of response so they don't feel like they're just out there in, you know, the, the ether. Um, that either a student is responding to them or the instructor is responding to them um, so that they're getting some kind of um, interaction and feedback. And so some faculty members will use a spreadsheet where they will go through and say, um, just make sure and check off that each student is getting some kind of response and maybe um, throughout the, the quarter or the term you are, you have engaged with, you have interacted with each student at least a few times so that they know that you're there, you're participating, you're reading their work um, and that they're getting some response. Um, I don't think that instructors need to respond or participate, you know, respond to every student uh, or um, engage, um, really dominate the, uh, the discussion. I think that can have a negative impact, um, but students should know that the instructor is there, that's socially present within this online environment uh, and engage with them, maybe responding to specific questions, clarifying points, making sure that the discussion doesn't get off track. Uh, and so, just participating as needed within those discussions. And making sure that students respond first uh, to each other so that they recognize that this is a peer-to-peer -peer learning environment and they're not just waiting for the instructor to respond to their work, but they are engaged with each other. Um, highlighting quality responses that you find. I mentioned about you know, posting model responses, but also you know, in your responses to discussions or in your weekly announcements, you could say, you could call out, you know, where students have really um, done a great job of responding to a question uh, or bringing in outside evidence or information uh, and, and give them some props, give them, you know, some gold stars for their work. Uh, then it's, it's also useful to have 
uh, an FAQ forum, um, a frequently asked questions forum, where you can post responses to questions that you get quite frequently from students, you know, whether it's about a text uh, or whether it's about how they should be engaging in the, in the discussions or the annotations or online assignments. Um, that just makes it easier for you. So you don't necessarily have to be responding to each individual student, but you can post things that all students can get information on. Uh, and students will often answer each other's questions as well. Um, so you don't have to necessarily respond to every question. So we have about 15 minutes left. Uh, so I wanted to ask you again in the chat, um, if you could post, you know, what, what best practices do you have for creating and facilitating online engagement? Maybe some of these things that I've mentioned, maybe some things that I haven't mentioned, um, you could post in the chat. Uh, and then um, also we'll have time to respond to the specific questions that you've been posting or that you want to post within the Q&A. So I'm going to stop sharing now and take a look uh, in the chat and um, I guess be getting the questions from our, our other moderators. Yes, we have recorded some questions for you, Chris. Okay, great. Yeah, so when, when you're ready for them, just let me know. Um, yeah, let's get started. Okay, did you tell students at the beginning of the co course that you would be analyzing their work? Yes, um, so I post my rubrics um, within the modules within Canvas and you know attached to the discussion assignments um, and so they know that they are going to be assessed on their work uh, within discussions and annotations and um, they know exactly what they're going to be graded on and and then like i said i use the rubric to um, evaluate on specific criteria and then to give them specific feedback um, to help them develop their engagement and their participation but did you tell them that you would be analyzing it more for um, like this session? Oh, for the analytics part of it and the survey? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I did let them know that um, this was the first time that I was using Perusal, that I was gonna ask them questions about it in a survey uh, and that I would be looking at it um, in terms of presenting and comparing these two, yeah. Okay, um, there was a question early on, uh, what are annotation tools? And you, Weiwei tried to answer that and you did, um, but um, have you tried any yeah. other type of annotation tools or is, is Perusal the only one? I did look at a few different tools. Um, Perusal was the one that I chose, but I looked at one called Hypothesis um, I think there's another one called Comment Now. Uh, and why I liked Perusal was because um, the interface I, I felt uh, was the most kind of user friendly. Uh, it seemed like a good way for you to both upload your own digital documents, but you could also use full textbooks within the platform. Um, it, seem to have a very robust interface and the analytics that I mentioned. Uh, it also, uh, it, it developed, um, it's developed by Eric Majer, um, who is at Harvard and he created um, other tools, instructional technology tools. It seemed like a very stable platform that had a lot of support. Um, and so for, for my use case, it seemed the best. I think Hypothesis allows you to um, annotate web pages and websites uh, in ways that if you want to do that, it's probably a little bit better than digital text. Um, and uh, I think Comment Now is maybe more of a K-12 tool, um, but I haven't used it much at all. And uh, so Perusal was the one that I decided to investigate. Um, there is also a 
integration with Canvas, which I haven't used for Prusol. Um, that requires some work from the administrator, um, the, the Canvas administrator, but you can directly integrate Prusol within Canvas as well. Okay, great. Somebody just posted that Perusal just added YouTube videos too. So yes, you can link to YouTube videos or upload your own videos within Perusal uh, and have students annotate on the video. Uh, I, I've just seen it in a presentation. I haven't used it myself, but it's a little bit confusing because you the comments are posted according to the video timeline. Uh, and when you have multiple comments on, around a certain part of the video, it's hard to click into kind of each conversation. So I think the user interface for videos is still needs a little bit of work, but it is there. Okay. Um, so Chris, there was a question from the audience about how many students do you ask to reply? You might have mentioned that, but could you give us a reminder? Um, so I ask students to do at least two replies to, to other students. Um, and usually, yeah, they'll do the minimum. But once you start uh, letting them know that the expectation is they're asking questions of each other and they're responsible for responding to any follow-up questions, then they're going to just, if they want to, you know, do the work appropriately, they're going to be responding to more than just two students. Okay. Another question, how do you facilitate multiple deadlines on the same board in Canvas? This is something someone struggled with. Yeah, I mean, because in Canvas, assignments can only have one deadline. What I do is I have the early deadline for their initial posting early in the week, and then <laughs> In my instructions, I let them know that they're also responsible for responding to other students, you know, the next day or the following day. And I'll put in a task uh, into the course calendar that says, that gives the second deadline. So by, you know, post your initial response on Monday, by Wednesday have responded to other students, and I'll put in a task within the Canvas calendar uh, for that follow-up response on Wednesday. And that gives them um, a to-do list within their calendar. Um, it's not a deadline per se, but they will see it. And since so many students use that calendar to organize their schedule and their responses, um, they, they will, you know, see that sometimes more than just remembering. Right. Also, right. Once, once you get on a schedule too, they know they know that I have to post Monday after Spawn Wednesday um, and any follow-ups, you know, by the, the end of the week on Friday. Um, so once you develop that weekly schedule, they'll get on track. Yeah, that's the way I do my discussion posts too. Uh, how many graded, uh, how many rubric graded discussions annotations are you executing in a given week? Um, for this class, for this intro to lit class, which is a general education class, and um, I will just do two per week. So usually there's one discussion, maybe and one annotation per week. Um, in my literature classes for majors, there's going to be usually a little bit higher requirements. Um, and then I might have um, a student a, a instructor-led instru uh, discussion and a student-led discussion or annotation, um, but usually no more than two types of assignments per week. Okay, so how effective, in your opinion, is the machine grading that Perusal does? Um, it's pretty rudimentary. Um, you can get a, a high grade, a 95 or 100, um, with fairly minimal kind of effort. Like if you, if you do the specific number of responses required uh, and you write a fairly substantial amount of text, uh, it's going to give you the student a, a high grade. So if you really want to dig in uh, and do more direct evaluation of student work and assessment, um, I would suggest that you use your own rubric and, and annotate it. Um, I think the, 
the machine grading with Improzol is really meant more for um, how engaged they are with the reading and making sure they're actively reading and responding, but not for developing this level of engagement and participation with each other. Okay, do you ask the same types of questions in Perusal and Canvas? And do you think certain types of questions are better suited for the annotation software? Um, what I've done, and again, I've just used Perusal, you know, for two quarters. Uh, the prompts or questions within Perusal for annotation, for me, are more directly engaged with the text itself. So for literature, I'm asking them to look for literary features and symbols and uh, interact or show how those um, reflect some of the themes of the literature. Um, in the discussion, uh, they're more thematic kinds of questions. Um, and so that is the way that I approached it just because again, the annotation is asking them to focus so specifically or more specifically on the text in front of them. And the discussions are, are questions are a little bit more broad. Um, but I think, I think you could do similar questions for both. Um, but because the annotation is so text focused, I've, I've made the questions more text focused. Okay, uh, one more. You mentioned providing feedback. How do you give feedback? Do you use the annotation tool or private emails or messaging? Um, I use the Canvas rubrics. Um, and so I will create my rubrics within Canvas. And then I will grade or evaluate uh, using the, the rubric tool, which allows you to both, you know, check the criteria, assign points, but also give feedback, whether it's around that specific criteria or a general comment. Uh, and so that's how I give the feedback primarily. And so then students will go into their grades, see the grade, be able to click on the rubric, see the criteria that they've been evaluated on and read the specific feedback. Um, and I do remind them every time to, you know, to view that rubric and the feedback that I've given them um, so that they can um, use that feedback to get better, improve in terms of their responses and participation. Okay, if students can read other students' annotations, does it get mess messy and difficult to work through? Um, yeah, the students did feel, like I said, that um, it can be a little messy when they're first reading a text to see all the comments and highlights and annotations. And so I would recommend, and I do recommend to students now that they turn off the annotations when they first read the text, if they're, if they're reading the text online uh, through perusal, uh, and then, you know, develop their own response to the text and then turn back on the highlights uh, and comments and, and respond to the comments. Um, they, uh, there has been some questions, you know, about people um, cribbing off of other people's comments, you know, or basically just copying and pasting. Um, I think both in discussions and annotations, that can be an issue. In discussions, you can require that students post first without seeing anyone else's replies. Uh, and that can be a way to, to limit the the plagiarism, you know, within within discussions. Um, I don't think there's that same setup within perusal, but you can do that in Canvas discussions. Okay, we have one more question. Okay. Uh, how widely is perusal used at Central Washington University? Do you know any instructors from other subject areas using it? Um, I do know that there are other instructors using it, um, especially I think during this remote learning time um, that people are, are using it more and as instructors use more open education resources and digital texts. Um, I, I think that there are people within uh, world languages, um, history that I know of. Um, I do know that 
there are other annotation tools that people are using with digital textbooks within physics and some of the sciences. Um, we haven't, as an institution, connected Perusal with Canvas yet, which I think would increase adoption. Um, but that's um, something I'm gonna talk to our multimodal learning team about. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I'm watching the clock, yeah. we are at the hour. Um, this is super timely as we start a new school year and a lot of things for us to think about and maybe try out some new ideas. So we're going to close the webinar now. Thank you everyone for your joining in. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and we look forward to having you in our future sessions. Thank you. Yes, thank you everyone for participating. Bye for now. Bye.